It is an understatement to say that Robert Langton Douglas had a long and varied career. Chaplain for the Church of England in Italy, Professor of Modern History at the University of Adelaide in Australia, Private in the British Army, rising to Captain in the First World War, Director of the National Gallery of Ireland, Dealer of Old Master Paintings, and in his 50s, in his 80s rather, in the 1940s, Duveen employee at the New York office. Douglas was primarily a specialist in early Italian painting, in particular the study of Siena and its art. His most important publications were concentrated in the years 1900 to 1904, and during this period he produced a monograph on Fra Angelico, his history of Siena, his edition of Crone Cavalcazzelli's New History of Painting in Italy for publisher John Murray, co-edited with Giacomo de Nicola and Arthur Strong, the catalogue for the Burlington Fine Arts Club's 1904 Sienese Art Exhibition, La Maionica di Siena, and several articles for the Burlington Magazine. When he was in his 80s and working for Duveen in New York, he was a prolific contributor to Art Quarterly too, and produced other choice publications for a general audience on Piero di Cosimo and Leonardo da Vinci. However, his work as a published author and as a researcher culminated in his disagreement with the Berensons, Frederick Mason Perkins, Lucy Olcott and Roger Fry over the rediscovery of Sassetta, which played out in the Burlington Magazine in 1903, the first year of the journal's publication. And though Douglas had the last word at the time, perhaps thanks to his friendship with the editor of the magazine, he went on to make, and he went on to make a tolerable living working in the trade. His career as a published art historian never truly recovered from the incident. Douglas had a troubled relationship with connoisseurs and connoisseurship. In May 1903, he wrote a letter to the newly formed Burlington magazine entitled Professor Langton Douglas and Documentary Evidence, from which I take my title, and this sought to refute criticisms laid out by Robert Hobart Hust in his review of Douglas's recent history of Siena. Douglas suggested that Cust should not involve himself in discussions of documentary evidence, rather that he should limit himself to the practice of some so-called scientific critics who content themselves by making an unsupported dogmatic assertion upon any question, following it by a statement that those who did not disagree with him were not connoisseurs and did not possess an eye that sees. This is, of course, a thinly veiled reference to his interactions with Bernard Berenson. This kind of criticism, Douglas writes, is as easy as shelling peas and requires no laborious training. And this touchy response to any kind of criticism is characteristic of Douglas. He likes to write verbose defences of his work. And I've been tracking these <laughs> across the ocean. He writes these kinds of very elaborate, long defences in, in all kinds of places, expertises and letters, as well as publications of this kind. The second part of this letter, however, demonstrates that despite a vocal dismissal of scientific methods, he still very much liked to use them when it was convenient. And here Douglas digs deep into the disputed dating of Matteo de Giovanni's Massacre of the Innocents at the Church of the Servi. Douglas reiterates his view that the painting was painted in 1471, not 1491, as Cavall Gazzelli has stated that is, relatively early in Matteo de Giovanni's career and earlier than the three other versions at Capo di Monte, San Agostino and in the Duomo. In support of this uh, statement and this argument, he provides uh, suggestions related to the painting's composition, more obviously symmetrical and not nearly so well-spaced as the other examples, less skill in rendering of form, not so gruesomely realistic with its expressions of violent emotion, so setting up a kind of um, a sense that this is an inferior painting in some ways and therefore worthy of an earlier date. These ob observations, really, are only made to support his main argument that the painting should be connected to the will of Francesco de Tolomei. Documentary evidence that he writes is stronger even than the stylistic. So 
even in a letter where he is voicing loud opposition to scientific methodologies, he nonetheless finds space for visual arguments to support theories originating from archival evidence. And we should note, of course, that the survey painting is now generally dated to 1491, as Kevel Gazelli had suggested. Despite his avowals to the contrary and his rather haphazard abilities, there is no doubt that Douglas deserves his place in a seminar of this kind. His attributions may not always stand the test of time. Uh, Roger Fry once described Douglas as blind as a mole, um, a man who approached connoisseurship as if it were a game of billiards. Certainly, it would be fair to say that Douglas's visual analysis skills were not his strength always. However, his long and varied career provides an interesting insight into trends in art historical practice as his work shifted from a spiritual view to a documentary approach to his attempts at the connoisseurial. So in this talk, I will discuss Douglas's methods in research and connoisseurship, um, concentrating on the most active period of his publications. And I will present some of his discoveries and more of his mistakes um, in the field of CNE's painting. I suggest that while Douglas aspired to a reputation for connoisseurship on a par with contemporaries like Berenson, his research methods did not rely on stylistic analysis, but rather were only used to support other theories that he was trying to promote. And as such, this parting of a ways between Douglas and Berenson could be understood as symptomatic of some of the deeper divisions between connoisseurial and archival research approaches in the history of art at this period. Robert Langton Douglas was born the son of a clergyman in 1864, so he and the Berensons were contemporaries. He studied modern history at the University of Oxford, where we can assume he first came into contact with early Italian painting at the Ashmolean um, and the Christchurch Picture Gallery, which both held comprehensive collections of Italian primitives thanks to bequests in the early 19th century. Douglas later cited Walter Pater as an influence but any cultural historian of his generation would also have been hugely influenced by John Ruskin, also an alumnus of Oxford and Christchurch, as well as the Christian histories of art by writers like Lord Lindsay, Anna Jameson, and French Catholic Alexis Francois Rio. Douglas was initially ordained as a chaplain and worked for the Church of England in Italy in the 1890s. And during this period, he researched his first monograph on Fra Angelico. Fra Angelico had been hugely popular in 19th century England, where he was appreciated for the spiritual elements of his work. And as such, I think the choice of subject is very telling. It tells us a lot about Douglas's religious motivations in his scholarship initially, and it also indicates his origins, uh, like Horn perhaps, as a child of the 19th century, if not as an aesthete, then certainly uh, a child of the Victorian age. This publication was also the beginning of Douglas's disagreement with Bernard and Mary Berenson and Roger Fry, and the beginning of Douglas turning against this new connoisseurship, that is, the scientific methods that had their foundation in the work of Giovanni Morelli, as Ilaria della Monica um, outlined for us yesterday. During research for Fra Angelico, Douglas had visited Berenson and spoke to him during his research for the book, but Berenson felt when the book came out, that Douglas had not credited him fully enough in his publications. Roger Fry's review of Douglas's book in the pilot suggested this, that Douglas had not given Berenson sufficient recognition. And Fry's review, incidentally, relied heavily on Mary Berenson's own copy of Douglas's book, which Douglas found when he went round to Roger Fry's house to have a conversation about this review. And this, to me, is really the beginning of uh, Douglas's persecution complex, which uh, drives a lot of his um, drives a lot of the way that he writes later later in his career. And Berenson um, wrote to Douglas himself, um, saying that if Douglas wished Berenson to take him seriously, he must, in the first place, do serious work as a connoisseur. If you must write on art, do not pose as a connoisseur. For of connoisseurship, you have not grasped as much as the rudiments. And Douglas took this as a challenge. From thenceforth, Douglas was vocally opposed to connoisseurship, to scientific methods in principle, while he nonetheless took every opportunity to draw attentions to the failures of those methods as he saw them. <laughs> 
According to Douglas, he first came across Sassetta when he was working on his monograph of Fra Angelico, when he had gone to see a painting attributed to Angelico um, in the Saracini collection at Siena. As Douglas told the story, he recognised that this picture, picture was not by Fra Angelico, but by another Sienese artist unknown to him, and curious to discover its author, he went to the Siena Gallery and found evidence that led him to conclude the painting was by Sassetta. And he published this attribution in his Fra Angelico monograph, noting that the picture was a late work of Sassetta, long attributed to Fra Angelico himself, which has closest affinities with the great Florentine's representations of the same subject. And as Gabriele Fattorini noted yesterday, Frederick Mason Perkins later claimed that Lucy Olcott had made the same discovery at the same time as Douglas, even if Douglas had managed um, to publish this discovery sooner. And there seems to have been um, rather a disagreement here between um, the Berensons and Perkins and Olcott as to whether Douglas had made this discovery himself or whether he had just uh, really uh, had, been, had been told this um, by one of them. Um, Perkins and Fry were both convinced that Douglas had actually got there on his own and, and said as much to Berenson, but Berenson, I think, was, was never convinced by that argument. Douglas presented his second Sassetta discovery, the mystic marriage of St. Francis at Chantilly, as another fortuitous event. He described how he came across a reproduction of the painting while looking through some of Brown's photographs and, having no previous knowledge of the picture, recognised at the first glance that it was the work of the master he had been studying. Douglas's attribution was then published in the His History of Siena one of a number of monographic studies of Siena and its art that were published between 1900 and 1903, as we heard yesterday. And during research for his book, Douglas took rooms near the Porta Romana to work in the archives, walk across the battlefields, and spend time with other specialists who were living and working in Siena at this period. So Lucy Alcott, her husband Frederick Mason Perkins, William Hayward, Alcott's co-author on the Guide to Siena, Robert Hobart Cust, author of the Payment Masters of Siena, um, Edmund Gardner, author of the Story of Siena and San Gimignano, and others. And Douglas later enjoyed casting rather a sunny um, view of this period. He described this group as the old Sienese gang, um, which sounds very friendly and fond, but that does no justice to the shifting allegiances between the groups. Um, Haywood and Douglas remained close friends, whereas Cust, Olcott and Perkins became closer to the Berensons, um, though Olcott and Perkins also held Cust at arm's length because he had once tried to prevent their marriage. All very, all very personal, um, uh, lots, of, lots of sort of personal anxiety going on here. Olcott and Hayward had co-authored their guide to Siena, of course, but their friendship suffered as the rift between Berenson and Douglas grew. And I mentioned these alliances and friendships and disagreements um, because they really were defined by and also defined the different methodological the different methodological approaches of these groups. A kind of increasing polarization between people interested in archival approaches and people who are working with Berenson and working in a more scientific approach. Despite his discoveries, as we have heard, Douglas did not describe himself as a scientific critic, the term he used to describe Berenson and other contemporaries. He was first and foremost a historian who cultivated relationships with archivists and used their work as well as his own discoveries in his History of Siena. Um, this text uh, presents anecdotes, social history and archival evidence to present a history of the city that ultimately reinforces uh, 19th century ideas of Siena as a backward medieval city of mystical art. So again, demonstrating his, uh, his, his adherence to maybe a rather old fashioned kind of art history still at this time. Douglas argued that Siena's most prosperous years were under the rule of the nine, the Sienese people were spiritual, their lives were led by their devotion to the Virgin, and this inspired their uh, hieratic sumptuousness of their art. And he argued that Sienese painting could be mapped onto Sienese political history. After a glorious childhood, Sienese painting's youth was arrested and subsequently it developed but little. In fact, it preserved much of the naivete of its first childhood until overtaken by its second, 
But like the Sienese Republic, the school painting of this strange people, after a long period of decline, made a glorious end. And this narrative of Sienese art history had its root in 19th century progressivism. Douglas argued that the achievements of Duccio, Simone Martini and the Lorenzetti in the Trecento ended with the Black Death, after which Sienese painting suffered a decline before its rebirth at the hands of Sassetta. Douglas's guide to the history of Siena, entirely rooted in very old-fashioned ideas, um, born, born out of his um, interest in older, older art historical texts. He argued, um, he argued that Sienese birth had been reborn um, with Sassetta, Giovanni di Paolo, Noroccio, Matteo di Giovanni, um, ending gloriously with the work of Baldassare Peruzzi and Domenico Bettafumi. But Douglas's appreciation of the Sienese Quattrocento um, also marks a departure from earlier scholars' denigration of that period of Sienese art. His interest in what he termed the school's second childhood was related to this perceived interest in the spiritual character of people living in the 15th century of Siena. Uh, like many of his generation, he made much of Siena's status as the ancient city of the Virgin um, and a reappraisal of Saints Catherine and Bernardino's role in the life of the city. As, as we've heard already, Douglas's father was a clergyman. He spent several years as a clergyman himself. Um, and like several of his contemporaries, his interest in Sienese art was certainly connected to his own spirituality and beliefs. And yet, his presentation of Sienese art and his connoisseurial efforts ultimately had their basis um, in a vision of the school's evolution, um, in arguments that artists of different generations were connected by threads according to their training and their influence. And these ideas are really exemplified in his representation of Sassetta's art and career, both in this publication and elsewhere. Um, and Douglas gave this painting um, to Sassetta, arguing that it was in the flesh painting, the technique, the delicate drawing of its features that Sassetta's hand is revealed. Sassetta's indebtedness to Simone is manifest in every line of his best works. Um, and this positioning of Sassetta as an heir to Simone is characteristic of Douglas's presentation of the Sienese school more generally as a kind of collection of, um, of families of artists. As he put it, between the days of Simone and the days of Matteo, there was no one save Sassetta who painted flesh of the same fine, delicate quality as to be found in the works of these two artists. This painting is, of course, uh, given to Matteo di Giovanni today, and we, we heard yesterday, of course, that Perkins and Berenson were soon onto this after Douglas was writing um, with a brief sojourn towards Andrea Vanni, which I'll come to in a, in a minute. Um, however, none of Douglas's uh, arguments about the painting, uh, nonetheless, Douglas's arguments about this painting really exemplify the importance he placed on multi generational networks of influence in Sienese painting in particular. Okay. Like Douglas, the Berenson, Berenson's interest in Sienese painting had begun in the 1890s. Berenson's central Italian painters of the Renaissance had set out some of these ideas in 1897, but he did not include Sassetta in the lists and only made passing reference to the ever winsome Sassetta. Um, attributing the mystic marriage to Sano di Pietro. A second list of sacred pictures that Douglas doesn't seem to have known, actually, uh, was co-authored with Mary's brother, Logan Pearson Smith, um, in The Golden Urn in 1898. But this, uh, this list attributed the mystic marriage to Vecchietta. A good thing Douglas didn't get hold of that one. Um, however, by March 1898, the Berensons already had some idea that the mystic marriage was by Sassetta, as Machtelt Israels has noted, and Mary Berenson's art notebooks include a reference to sacred Sassetta, long necks of Shanti, which gives a year. On the 29th of October 1900, Mary Berenson bought the Blessed Ranieri, St. Francis in Glory, and St. John the Baptist, then framed as a triptych. And by this date, the Berensons were working in collaboration with Perkins and Lucy Olcott. And all four scholars were already interested in Sassetta and working on a reconstruction of the San Sepulchre altarpiece. The group could only regret their collective oversight in not correcting their mistake in central Italian painting sooner. 
particularly when Douglas wrote in the History of Siena that Mr. Berenson does not consider Sassetta worthy of a place in his list of Sienese painting and gives his best work to his pupil, Sano di Pietro. In this fallout, Perkins, in particular, urged the Berensons to publish their findings on the San Sepulchre altarpiece as soon as possible to try and rectify um, Douglas's <coughs> ownership of Sassetta as an artist. And he was also very keen to publish a related piece of research that I think has been rather overlooked in, in this context, um, his article on the career of Andrea Vanni, which was another collaborative project overdue publication. Um, and in fact, Olcott's Guide to Siena really omits any mention of Andrea Vanni in anticipation of this forthcoming article that was eventually published in the Burlington magazine, um, saving the spoilers for this article, which would bear Frederick Mason Perkins name as author. So it was unfortunate when the group were preempted by Douglas again. Robert Dell, editor of the Burlington magazine, agreed to publish Douglas' Douglas's article on Sassetta first in May 1903. Perkins's article on Andrea Vanni appeared in August, 19, uh, in August 1903, and then Berenson's two-part article, Seeing These Painted the Franciscan Legend, appeared in October and November 1903. Um, but by this point, the Burlington magazine was in a precarious financial situation, and in what the editor thought might be the journal's last issues, he allowed his friend Douglas to add footnotes to Berenson's second article, citing his own work, contradicting Berenson's arguments, and correcting some of his statements. And then in December 1903, Douglas was permitted to publish the last of this um, messy group of articles, a note on recent criticism of the art of Sassetta. And this last article posed a response to Berenson and Perkins' arguments that the San Pietro of the Annunciation should be attributed to Andrea Vanni. Douglas denounced this claim as a lamentable example of the unintelligent use of the scientific method. And again here, Douglas' arguments turn on a concept of artistic lineage. Um, he argues that the identifying peculiarities that Perkins associates with Vanni's work are in fact just characteristics of all artists who belongs to what he calls the artistic lineage of Bartolo di Fredi. Douglas also took the opportunity to reiterate his own attribution of the painting to Sassetta um, and used, made some relatively sensible observations, I suppose, um, about the, the draperies, lettering, decorative framework, and so on. But he really concludes this by uh, suggesting, and this is significant, um, I think, uh, by suggesting that his rival's attribution of this painting to Andrea Vanni really just signalled um, a lack of sense of quality, which to him lay at the heart of the difference between the work of Vanni, who he considered third rate, and Sassetta, an artist he considered to be of this first order. Um, and, and this for him, I think, was one of the most damning things that he could say, that there was no sense of, no sense of quality. Um, this disagreement um, does not end with these articles, um, however. Um, and as the curator of the first British exhibition of Sienese art at the Burlington Fine Arts Club in 1904, Douglas continued his persecution of Berenson in the catalogue, um, was noted at the time. His presentation of the works in this exhibition followed, again, his principles um, of understanding attribution according to networks of influence. But this exhibition also presented a visual argument for the history of seeing his painting in his hang, which, again, deliberately drew attention to these uh, attributions he regarded as mistakes, uh, Berenson's mistakes regarding Sassetta and Perkins's mistakes regarding Andrea Vanni. Um, first, um, a little background to the Burlington Fine Arts Club and its Siena exhibition, um, to which we are all indebted to studies of Elisa Camporiali. Um, the Burlington Fine Arts Club had been founded in 1866 um, as a place for amateurs, collectors and connoisseurs to meet, discuss and study works of art from their own collections. And from the 1890s, they also held exhibitions. The club's exhibition of pictures of the School of Siena and examples of minor arts of that city was first proposed in June 1903 to run contemporaneously to the exhibition of Sienese art in Siena, scheduled for 1904. 
and the connection between these two exhibitions was recognised by contemporary visitors. One reviewer described the London exhibition as an event to stimulate one's desire for a journey southward. Douglas was, of course, already perceived as an expert in the art of Siena. His estrangement from Berenson probably didn't hurt his reputation among the members. He resented Berenson's critique of uh, previous club exhibitions and other slights. And though Roger Fry attempted to dissuade the club from engaging Douglas as the exhibition's curator, he was nonetheless appointed. As Lisa Camporiale has noted, um, though this show was pioneering, it was fundamentally a small and ephemeral event. Um, not seen by many, the club had just shy of 1,500 members, and the exhibition was only visited by another 4,000 people or so. And it was only open for a couple of months. But nonetheless, it presents a sort of high watermark in um, Douglas's uh, research and in his work, um, despite being, um, I think, prompted to take many loans from the members, um, he deliberately sought out works from public institutions as well. And these form the kind of central thesis of um, his visual response, uh, final word, um, with Berenson and Perkins. The main gallery held 60 paintings arranged in roughly chronological order um, and Douglas again organised these exhibits in groups of works loosely focused around particular artist circles. Um, the Trecento centred on Duccio, on the Lorenzetti and on Simone um, and the Quattrocento also divided into groups focused around early Quattrocento paintings, Sassetta, Circle of Matteo Giovanni, the Circle of Benvenuto di Giovanni. In this way, his display attempted to present a, the school's cohesion, but also um, to map its evolution across these different sub, subgroups associated with different masters in their schools. And among these works, loans from the Royal Museum in Antwerp, the Fitzwilliam Museum, the Bowes Museum, and Christchurch Picture Gallery seem to have been borrowed with a deliberate intention to present a visual challenge and a visual argument against Berenson and Perkins's connoisseurship. The Bowes Museum Sassetta, a miracle of the sacrament, was positioned between uh, the, the late work of Simone um, and the work of Sassetta's follower, Sano de Pietro, with whom Berenson had confused Sassetta's work. So he's striking up a lineage between these artists um, and deliberately taking some liberties with the chronology which he presented in the catalogue um, to put Simone in closer proximity to these artists in order to make this argument that he's, that he's putting forward. The comparison between the miracle of the sacrament and Christchurch Picture Gallery San Luis Pietro, which was then one of the best known examples of that artist's work in Britain, drove home this comparison between Sassetto and Sano di Pietro, inviting the question, how could Berenson possibly have confused these two artists? Um, and then between Simone and Sassetta, Douglas also includes the Fitzwilliams Andrea Vanni. And this was again another pointed gesture towards the recent um, article on Andrea Vanni that had given the San Pietro Arvoli Annunciation, which Douglas believed was by Sassetta, to uh, Vanni. Uh, as we've heard earlier, Douglas was convinced this painting should be attributed to Sassetta. So side by side, these paintings again invite a similar question. How could Perkins and Berenson have possibly confused the work of Sassetta with an artist like Vanni? And Douglas has deliberately chosen a painting which I think he believes represents what he describes as the nadir of Sienese painting, the worst possible Sienese painting you could imagine. This is the one that he has chosen and borrowed purposefully for this argument. And indeed, the Berensons um, later speculated that Douglas had deliberately omitted two known, very beautiful um, pictures by Andrea Vanni because they would have disproved his argument here that Vanni was a third-rate artist um, and that uh, the San Pietro Avalé Annunciation should be attributed to Sassetta. Whether this was the case or not, uh, I think it's, it's clear that Douglas has made a deliberate effort to uh, position Sassetta's Miracle of the Sacrament here in, um, among these works in order to create these contrasts um, and prompt people to um, 
remember these supposed mistakes that had been made by scientific connoisseurs um, who he was in, in an argument with. And this was, while this thesis was generally accepted, um, critics considered this to be really quite distasteful. Um, so while the exhibition really vindicated Douglas's ideas, the project in some ways drew a line under Sienese painting as a subject and scholarship in Britain anyway, um, and prompted a lot of people to look elsewhere for topics of research and sources of income. Um, I would like to conclude with a few words on Douglas's approach to connoisseurship and research in his later career as a dealer. Um, even before the Burlington Fine Arts Club, Douglas had begun to turn his hand to dealing. And during the exhibition run, Douglas met uh, American financier and art collector J.P. Point Morgan, who had asked Sir Lionel Cust to arrange for Douglas to give Morgan a private tour of the exhibition. Morgan subsequently invited Douglas to visit him in Paris and, on hearing of Douglas's financial difficulties, sent Douglas a cheque for £1,000 so that Douglas could continue to work on his research on the understanding that Douglas would also acquire paintings for Morgan. And through Douglas, Morgan acquired 16 paintings, all but one of which were attributed to Sienese artists. And some of the paintings were still on display in the Burlington Fine Arts Club at the time of their sale. Douglas later boasted that these Sienese paintings, bought by Morgan in 1904, inspired a new demand for Sienese art on the international art market. In 1904, he reminisced that the news went round in Bond Street, Morgan's buying Sienese pictures. The effect can be compared to that produced in Wall Street when, after some great slump, it began to be whispered, Morgan is buying steel ordinary. The great collector had, in his complex temperament, a certain mystical strain, inherited, no doubt, from some Welsh ancestor. He liked seeing these pictures. And this was certainly true. The Giovanni di Paolo and Sano di Pietro panels hung in Morgan's bedroom at Prince's Gate, for some time anyway. And though it seems unlikely that these paintings affected the taste for seeing these paintings in the way that Douglas claimed, as none of these paintings were ever on view to visitors or included in the catalogue, let alone shipped to the States. Instead, they remained at Prince's Gate, or in the UK anyway, until they were sold at the posthumous sale of his son, Jack. Nonetheless, this um, great deal for Morgan certainly launched Douglas's career as a dealer. Um, he, he later complained that he'd been unable to uh, make enough money to send his children to school um, through working as a published art historian, and that was why he turned to dealing, which is no surprise to anyone, I think. After some training with a Bond Street dealer for some months, Douglas set up shop at 110 Piccadilly in 1904, so this is around the time that he's already selling paintings to Morgan. Even as a dealer, Douglas really relied most successfully upon documentary sources um, rather than connoisseurial sources in his quest to seek out sunk masterpieces in British private collections. His business files, today held at the Met, include several notebooks that document his efforts at tracing lost works by celebrated old masters that were lent to, picture, to exhibitions in the previous century. And works are listed by artist. Fra Angelico, Mantegna, Sebastiano, Titian, with notes on when these paintings were last exhibited or sold and where, if known, their current owners or owners' descendants were living. And uh, honestly, as far as I've been able to ascertain from looking in, in archives all over the place, Douglas very rarely reattributed paintings, which he found by this method. Um, he would seek out a famous painting and then tell um, Boda often that he had found this great work um, and, and it was ripe for the picking and it would always be Boda who would point out that is absolutely not a Rembrandt. Um, when these strategies worked however it did lead to very impressive discoveries and it was by this method that Douglas rediscovered um, David's deposition and Giovanni Bellini's St Francis in the Desert now at the Frick. Um, he did this by tracing the descendants of their previous owner, who had lent the paintings to the 1857 Manchester Art Treasures Exhibition. 
as a dealer selling to clients overseas, uh, and his prestigious clients included major private collectors and museums in the States, Douglas also lent increasingly on a different kind of documentary evidence, photographs, which were, as he put it, indispensable in the study of paintings. And in 1932, he wrote an article for the Burlington magazine that published several photographs of paintings he had come across during his time as a dealer. Ostensibly, this article presents new discoveries and invites other scholars to do the research he says he doesn't have time to do in order to reunite these fragments with their larger ensembles. But there is also certainly a financial motive behind this kind of art historical crowdsourcing of research. Nonetheless, Douglas remained adamant that attributions could not be made from photographs alone. They could make a bad picture appear to be better than it is, and a good picture appear to be much worse than it is, he said. No critic ought to pronounce a final dogmatic judgment as to the authorship of a picture that he has not seen, and of which his knowledge is only that which can be gleaned from the evidence of a small and very imperfect reproduction. As many of his contemporaries uh, found, the supply of extra information in addition to a photograph became increasingly important to his sales tactics. When attempting to sell a painting overseas, Douglas would also write lengthy accompanying descriptions of the picture's condition, sharing the opinions of his conservator. And in the case with this painting, this Viverini, uh, which he successfully sold to Robert Lehman, he noted the significance of the crack in the central panel pointing out areas of regilding and assured the collector that the painting's condition was really just related to its frame, um, which, as you can see, was replaced very soon after purchase. Now, I find these letters very interesting as they demonstrate, I think, how expectations of expertise um, and of a dealer's expertise really shift from an emphasis on a connoisseurship of attribution to encompass other fields of knowledge too. Um, including but not limited to an understanding of the physical condition of paintings under consideration. Some words of conclusion then. Um, I hope that I, in this talk I've outlined some of the distinctive characteristics of Douglas's methodologies and his work as a connoisseur, haphazard as they are. Um, and the case of, of this painting, I think, really exemplifies Douglas's curiously evolutionary understanding of the CNE school in particular, a very old-fashioned approach which I believe reveals his adherence to 19th century texts at a time when other people are looking elsewhere. Um, I think we shouldn't forget that Douglas was the editor of the new volumes of Crow and Cabo Cazelli um, and had this kind of work on his mind perhaps. His belief uh, that influence could be traced across generations led him to double down on his attribution um, to Sassetta, um, whom he saw as an heir to Simone Martini. Um, and this reasoning, I think, as we all know, relies um, upon iconographic similarities that really do not stand today. So was Robert Langton Douglas a connoisseur on the same level as those he aspired to compete with? Berenson, Perkins, Fry. I don't think so. Decidedly not. But he nonetheless does cons deserve consideration um, among these figures for his own aspirations um, to this kind of connoisseurship. For a period of time, Douglas may have defined himself against the practice of connoisseurship, um, but this, I think, should be understood as symptomatic of these generational shifts in the way that work, uh, work his art history was developing at the time. His greatest successes, particularly um, his work uh, on the CNE School, were achieved through a combination of visual methods and documentary research that, that comprised more than just documents. And these were his strengths, together with a purple ink written style that could draw together such evidence with anecdotes, wit and emotion. Thank you.